The Big Story. Mommy, Mommy. I'm driving as fast as I can, Linda. I'm bleeding, Mommy. We'll be in the hospital in a few minutes. Mommy, I don't feel good. Keep your hand tight over the bullet hole. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. No. You'll be all right as soon as I can get you to... Lapeer, Michigan. The story of a reporter who followed through to the end one of the most brutal atrocities in American criminal history. Lapeer, Michigan. The story as it actually happened. Bill Noble's story as he lived it. Michigan, Indian summer, midnight. And you, Bill Noble, reporter for the Lapeer Press, are driving home after a pleasant visit at a friend. The night hangs softly, peacefully, over the dark, rolling hills. Ahead of you, a strange light flickers. You wonder what it is. But as you come nearer, you stop wondering. You can see a house burning now. The entire upper floor is aflame. As you drive into the grounds, your headlights light up a man and a young boy lying on the ground. Both obviously dead. Bill Noble, how'd you know about this so soon? I was just passing by, Sheriff. I say this is awful. I just got here myself. Hey, are you the sheriff? That's right. I'm a neighbor. Javits, my name. I just looked through the house. There's no one else in there. Hey, Ellie, Ellie. Who are you calling? My daughter. She said the wife and another child were still in the house, but I... You find them, Papa. Ain't no one in the house, Ellie. But you said they was. I looked upstairs and downstairs until the smoke drove me out. I tell you, there ain't no one in there. Who's supposed to be in there? His wife and daughter. That living room downstairs is a bloody mess. Blood all over, on the chairs, sofa, on the rug, even on the walls. Who's the dead man? Steve Wolchek and his little boy, Paul. Do you have any idea who shot them? He done it himself, killed himself, and Paul. How do you know? I live across the road. I was just going to bed when I saw the fire. I ran over and I saw Steve stumbling out of the house, holding Paul in his arms. I asked him, what happened to you? He said, I did it. I shot Paul and myself. Then I asked him, where's Ida and Linda? He just pointed to the burning house. And then he died. It was awful. Just awful. Might have shot his wife and daughter, too. Well, they must have gotten away, because no one's in there. Why'd he do it? Was he crazy? He was always jealous of Ida, always suspicioned her. Sheriff! Sheriff! Here I am, Sergeant. I phoned him about the fire. The state police are on their way down. There's also been a bad crack up on Route 42, two miles out of Hillsdale. Oh, what a night. All the houses are gone. Are. It's burning out from roof to cellar. I hope no one's in there. Now, that uh, accident, Sergeant, was it a local or a tourist car? A local. A woman by the name of Ida Wojcik and her daughter. What? They took them over to the Clarkson Hospital. Look! There goes the house! The horror of it has caught you, Bill Noble. You race along with the sheriff to the hospital, wanting to know more of this tragedy. You wonder, what can possess a man to shoot his own child? You wonder how his wife, Ida, can live through this tragedy. And at the hospital, you listen as she tells a story to the sheriff. He's been plaguing me all day about him. Who is him, Mrs. Wilczek? Hired hand, Chuck Snyder. My husband had a silly idea that Chuck and I were too friendly. That's why he fired him. Mm, Tell us what happened. He stopped off at Ross's bar for a beer. Beer always calms him down, but today he got worse. You went directly home from there? That's right. Mm. I went to bed. What about your kids? They were all right. They were asleep when we got home. I wasn't sleeping more half an hour when I woke up suddenly. There he was, standing all dressed, with a gun in his hand. I screamed and ran. He fired at me and missed. I ran outside into the field, and then I heard some more shots. I ran back. Didn't see him, so I ran to the kid's room. 
and I saw Linda was shot. I grabbed her and ran for the car. Drove as fast as I could to the hospital because she was... Didn't you stop for your boy, Paul? Weren't you worried about him, too? He loved Paul more than anything. I didn't believe he would ever hurt him. But he... He killed my boy. He killed my boy. You listen to her story, Bill Noble. You listen to her cry, inconsolably. There isn't much more to know except how her little daughter is making out in her fight for life. And so you go and see the doctor down at the other end of the corridor, hoping hard that the doctor will tell you the one piece of good news in this terrible tragedy. I'm sorry, but I cannot let you in. Well, doctor, could you tell me how she's doing? Who are you? I'm from the LaPierre Press, a reporter. The girl's dying. Dying? She's delirious and not saying anything to make sense. There's no point and no good reason why she should be visited. There's no hope? None. Well, Sheriff, what do you think? It's open and shut. Murder and suicide. If even Wojcik were alive, we'd hang him. Tell me, what makes a man kill his own kids? Some men are born lunatics. Well, I'm going back to my office and write up the story. Oh, by the way, Sheriff, uh, what was the name of the tavern Mrs. Wojcik said she and her husband were at? Uh, Ross's Tavern. Why? Oh, I think I'll just stop by there and get me beer. What'll it be, friend? Beer, huh? Here you are. Say, uh, did you hear about the Wojcicks? Yeah. Just can't believe it. Mrs. Wojcik said she was in here just before her husband went for Cirque. Weren't they in here? Yep. What'd they fight about? I never listened to other people's troubles, mister. Oh, when people quarrel, you just can't help listening. Maybe you can't. I can't. Now, look, I'm Bill Noble from the LaPia Press. I'm a reporter. I'd be much obliged if you'd help me. I told you, mister, I never listen. Excuse me, but uh, my name's Tom Hatcher. Don't bother introducing yourself. I always listen in on other people's conversations. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. I'll tell you something, Mr. Noble, that might interest you. I knew Steve Wolchek pretty well. You did? I've known him ever since he came to this country years ago. What was he like? He was a good Joe. A good Joe? The man that murders his two kids? I was telling you what I knew about him. I guess I knew him as well as anyone. He wanted to get ahead. He worked hard. He was crazy for his kids. He spoke English very bad, so he went to night school in order for his kids not to grow up with an accent. But even night school didn't help him much. Whenever he got excited, he jabbered away in Polish. Mm -hmm. You were a good friend of his, weren't you? I was. And I'm telling you the truth about Steve. I'd have gave him plenty of reason to hate her. She always poked fun at him. This poor English. This being left-handed. This being such a meek... Mouse with his boss at everything. Must have been insane. Maybe. If he was, she made him crazy. I'd have loved a good time. She and her girlfriend always cutting up. A girlfriend? A neighbor, Ellie Javits. Ellie Javits? And then she carried on with this Chuck Snyder, the hired hand. Man with a police record. Yeah, but none of this adds up to killing his own kids. I know it don't, Mr. Noble. That's why I'm telling you. It's hard for you to believe Tom Hatcher's story, Bill Noble. But now you have your teeth in a case that's not so open and shut. There's some doubt. And you have to wipe out that doubt. You go to see some of the neighbors. Now, look here, young fella. I don't believe everything they write in them newspapers. Steve wouldn't even go rabbit hunting. He was against killing anything. Now, how can you figure him killing his own two kids that he worshipped? Tell me that. I know him. I liked him. So did everyone in Hillsdale. You won't find a soul with a bad word for him. Not one. You do a pretty thorough job of interviewing the neighbors, Bill Noble. And now you're full of doubts. You go and see Ellie Javits, the girl who saw Steve Wojcik die. And as you talk to her, 
You watch her nervously torture a handkerchief. She scarcely looks at you. I told you what I heard Mr. Wolchek say. I did it. I killed Paul and myself. He didn't mention Linda's name? I don't remember hearing him say anything about Linda. Mm -hmm. Tell me, do you speak Polish, Miss Javits, or understand it? No. Did you ever hear Mr. Wolchek speak Polish? Sure. When? He never... He, he wanted to. I don't know when. You're asking me real fool questions. Well, didn't he lapse into Polish whenever he became excited or upset? Yes. Yes, he did. Do you think he'd be excited or upset after having shot himself and his two kids? You're asking me too many questions. I don't know what you mean. I mean that Steve Wojcik would have confessed in Polish. And even if his last dying words were in English, they certainly wouldn't have been so clear and grammatic. I told you what I heard. You want me to lie? No, I don't, Miss Javits. You'll go to prison if you lie. This case is going to be reopened. You're going to have to swear that you heard Mr. Wojcik say he did it. Now, we know that you and Ida are pretty close friends. If you're protecting her or that hired man, Chuck Snyder, you'll be in serious trouble. That's what I heard him say. I, I'm almost sure he said that. I... You'd better be absolutely sure, Miss Javits. Because I don't think Steve Wojcik murdered his family. <laughs> This is Cy Harris, returning you to your narrator and the big story of William T. Noble as he lived it and wrote it. As you hurry to the sheriff's office, Bill Noble, reporter on the Lafayette Press, with the new evidence about Steve Wojcik's character, your mind goes back to the sight of him, dead, clutching his dead son close to him. That's a sight you can't forget or forgive. You're determined to find the murderer. And at the moment, you're in the sheriff's office discussing the case. You interviewed all the neighbors, Bill? Most everyone, Sheriff. Not one bad word for him, not one good word for Ida. Well, you want me to reopen the case? Well, don't you think it warrants it? Well, it could be. Say, Sheriff, I was just wondering. That bullet wound that killed Wojcik, where was it? Do you remember? Uh, not exactly. It was on the side under the armpit. Uh, uh, which one, right or left? I don't remember. Why? Well, he was left-handed. He would only have shot himself on the left side. Well, now I'll call the undertaker. The body's still there. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, Ed. This is the sheriff. Say, take a look at the report on Stephen Wojcik and tell me where the bullet wound is, right or left side. Okay, I'll hold on. You want to take a look? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems to me it was... Hello? The right side. Uh -huh. You're sure now? Okay, thanks. Ah, that's it. He couldn't have killed himself. Are you sure he was left-handed? Oh, several people told me so. Maybe a left-handed man could shoot himself in the right side. Take your gun and try it. Let's see. No. No, it could be done. It would be awkward. Sheriff, a man that's about to commit suicide isn't going to take any chances of failing. Okay, the case is officially reopened. Okay. Now, we have two suspects. Mrs. Ida Wojcik and the hired man, Chuck Snyder. You know, the probability is that Chuck Snyder's our man. He has a police record. I know, I checked him, but it's all small stuff, disorderly conduct, petty thieving. Still, I'm going to arrest him. You want to come along? But Chuck Snyder is nowhere to be found. The sheriff rolls up his sleeves and goes to work. In an hour, the whole state is alerted for Chuck Snyder. Every policeman and detective in Michigan is on the lookout for a tall, heavy-set, black-haired man. Within a few hours, they find him. In a little town right outside of Detroit, his brother's home. You sit with the sheriff while he questions him. Why did you do it, Snyder? To what? Murder Steve Wojcik and his kids. Murder the... Are you crazy? If you didn't do it, why did you run away? I didn't run away. I was fired. You were a close friend of Mrs. Wojcik, weren't you? I worked for her on the farm. Answer the question. Yes, I, I was a friend of hers. But you're not going to pin this thing on me. No, sir. You've got a long police record. I'm no child killer. I ain't never killed anyone. Did you kill Steve? No, I didn't. Did she tell you to do it? I ain't killed anyone, I tell you. Where were you on the night of the murder? The night of the murder? That's what I said. I was in Detroit. That's where I was. 
Where in Detroit? In the Marquette restaurant. I work there as a waiter until 11.30 every night. I can prove it. You ain't going to pin a thing on me. I can prove it. Call him up. Go ahead and call him. He proved it, too, Bill Noble. The owner of the Marquette restaurant cleared him. It was impossible for Chuck Snyder to have been in Detroit and at the scene of the crime at the same time. I'm letting you go, Snyder. But don't you go running away. I want you to stay in town. I may be needing you. I ain't running. I don't like cops chasing me with their guns out of their pockets. Well, there goes our best suspect. Now, that leaves us only one. Ida Wojcik? Mm-hmm. No, it can't be her. No woman would murder her own children. Well, Sheriff, you were ready to believe the father did. I don't know what to believe anymore. She's still in the hospital? No, she's been discharged. Living with her sister. I think I'll pick her up and start asking a few questions. <laughs> While they're bringing in Ida Wojcik, you, Bill Noble, go back to the hospital, have a talk with the doctor. Perhaps Linda had regained consciousness before she died. Perhaps she had said something that might be of some help. Yes, Mr. Noble, what can I do for you? Uh, Doctor, I'm the reporter from the Lapeer Press. Oh, yes. You were in here about a week ago. Uh, Tell me, did Linda ever regain consciousness? No, not really. She was never completely lucid. (sighs) That's too bad. A plucky little girl. Fought very hard to live, but the odds were too much against her. Did she say anything at all before she died? Well, she kept repeating, Mommy shot me, Mommy shot me. You sure? Of course I'm sure. She was delirious. Can't go by that too much. People are liable to say anything in their delirium. Anything? Yes. Did she ever say that her daddy shot her? No. No, she didn't. Thank you, Doctor. That's all I want to know. Talking to Ida Wojcik for five hours. I didn't get to first base. She sticks to a story, huh, Sheriff? Oh, she tells one story over and over again. The drop of a hat, she'll repeat the whole thing word for word. Can't break her or shake her. You have to keep trying. If I know human nature, she's lying. Her story is too smooth. She remembers too many important details. She's too composed for a woman whose two kids have been murdered. Oh, Sheriff, she's not really composed. She's just holding tight. That's what I think, but it's no good unless we get a confession. We'll never convict her otherwise. Look, can I talk to her? Sure. Come on, I'll take you over to the cell. Uh, I'll go there myself. I'd rather do it alone. Hello, Mrs. Wojcik. Hello. Oh, I'm not a detective, just a reporter from the Lapeer Press. Why did they open this case again? After my husband confessed. Oh, that's the police for you. Always looking to stir up things. They have no right to keep me here. Oh, they'll have to let you go pretty soon. The way I see it, they haven't got a leg to stand on. It must be crazy to think a mother could kill her own kid. Besides, didn't Steve confess that he did it? Well, I I really think they opened this case for some political reason. Yeah. I bet that's it. Sure. Just don't let yourself get panicky. Say the wrong things. I won't. My story's perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll drop by tomorrow. I'll let you know what's happening. My paper's out to see that you get a fair deal, Mrs. Wojcik. And, uh, besides, uh, why, well, you're the prettiest prisoner they ever had in this prison. Nice of you to say that. Thanks. Hello, Mrs. Wojcik. Hello, Mr. Noble. How are they treating you? Rotten. Food's terrible. Well, you just keep calm. I'm not worried. They've been working on Ellie Javits. She's uh, not so sure now that Steve confessed. That little hussy. What's she afraid of? They can't do anything to her? Oh, of course not. But she's getting very jittery. Say, look, uh, do you mind if I take your picture, Mrs. Wojcik, for the paper? Oh, sure. Sure, okay. Fine. Hey, your profile, huh? That makes you look best. Uh-huh. Oh, there we are. I, uh, I hope it comes out as pretty as you really are.
Day after day, for two weeks, you, Bill Noble, went to see her, became friendly with her, broke down some of her resistance. She looked forward to seeing you every day. You confided in her, and in turn, she began to confide in you. Little things, nothing important, but you'd opened the door. Hello, Ida. Hello, Bill. How are you today? Lousy. I'm getting fed up with this place. Uh, you've got to learn how to relax. Anything new happen in my case? Yeah. Is it bad? Pretty bad. Tell me. Well, they got Ellie to admit that she wasn't sure what it was Steve said before he died. Instead of being sure that he said, I did it, she now agrees it sounded more like Ida did it. No. No. Now, the police have figured out something else. Steve couldn't have shot himself. He was left-handed. He was shot in the right side. He wasn't left-handed. He was right-handed. There are six neighbors who are ready to swear that he was left-handed. I, I didn't do it. I wouldn't kill my own kids. You believe me, don't you? Ida, I'm just telling you what the police are doing. Chuck did it. He's the one who did it. No, no, he didn't. He was in Detroit at the time. He can prove it. I swear I didn't do it. You believe me, Bill, don't you? Please. The doctor that treated poor Linda also told the police that Linda kept saying, Mommy shot me. Mommy shot me. The lie! The lie! On the way here, I stopped by your house, Ida. It's burnt to the ground. But I found this toy. A walking, chirping bird. There you see, it's still good. The fire never touched it. Little Paulie. My little Paulie. The doctor also said that Linda wasn't angry at you before she died. She kept calling for Mommy until the end. My baby. My baby. Ida, you'll never be able to sleep again until you get it off your mind. It'll tear you apart. You'll never have a moment's peace. It'll shake you to bits. It'll drive you stark, staring mad unless you talk. Come on, now tell it to me. You can't keep it inside you any longer. Tell it to me, Ida. Tell me. to take the kids to his mother. He said I wasn't fit to take care of them. Told him if he ever tried to take the kids away, I'd kill them. We had a terrible fight. When we got home, I took a gun and shot him and the kids. I was crazy, killing my own babies. When I saw little Linda lying on the floor, I realized what a dreadful thing I did. I grabbed her up and drove her to the hospital. Who will forgive me? The Lord will never forgive me for this horrible thing. Never. <laughs> Now we read you that telegram from William T. Noble of the Lapeer, Michigan Press. Murderous in tonight's big story pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Detroit House of Correction. At the trial, the judge said, There is no power in this court to punish the accused more than she has punished herself. For the rest of her life, she will be faced with the horror of what she did. <laughs> And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. The big story has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.